Okay, time to begin. I see everyone here but Andrew. And we are now into magnets. I spoke about magnets briefly Monday in lab. Here we'll get a better understanding, a more complete understanding of magnets. So we're going to cover some of the stuff from lab and more stuff. We actually won't get to electric motors until Friday, but so. So <clears throat> magnets, their, their actual discovery is, is kind of filled with mythology. Like, don't really know the story I was taught was some shepherd had a, a staff that had a metal tip on an iron tip on it, and he noticed that it stuck to some rocks. And the shepherd happened to be in the region called Magnesia, and so they called it magnetism based on the region Magnesia. Um, what is pretty clear is that magnetism used to be considered some kind of magical thing. And so I bought a book on magnetism thinking it was going to be a serious book to help me understand it better. No, no. It was just full of people's odd beliefs and that kind of thing. But magnetism is clear in what you saw in the lab. There are attractive and repulsive forces with magnets, which makes them pretty fun to play with. And so <clears throat> in studying magnetism, physicists have learned a lot of things, and we're going to look at those things that they've learned about magnets in this chapter. Chapter 14 is the chapter we're in right now. So first, a clicker question right off the top. And... You can answer starting now. What kind of material shows strong magnetic behavior? <laughs> Obviously, materials didn't fit on the slide. I didn't notice that. All right, everyone's answered. There's the answers we had. Now, this was just based on your preconceived knowledge. And we had some pretty good preconceived knowledge here because oftentimes people will think that it's all metals and that's wrong. Now, I should have left my magnets out here. Let's see if I have any left. Um, Rachel? Can you check in the cupboard there? And I'm going to check in the cupboard here to see if there's any magnets. Because the group was keeping the magnets up in the cupboard here. There aren't any of this, so there ain't that. Mm -hmm. No. Actually, give me a cart. The carts are... Oh, yeah, there's some magnets. That's the magnets? Okay. That's right. Okay, so here I have a button. Now, these magnets are pretty thin. What we found is because they're so thin, they're really brittle and we break them real easily. So I'm going to be a little careful with them. But things that we notice about the magnets are that they stick to some materials and not others. So for instance, this dust mop, why yes, that sticks. So that's magnetic. The plastic cap, what do you think? It's attracted to, to the dust, not to the cap. If I take it off, yeah, nothing. Doesn't pick it up. So we see some materials are magnetic, some are not. Well, this here, I believe, is a metal pipe. I gotta check. <laughs> no magnetic interaction there. So some metals are magnetic, some are not. Not magnetic, not magnetic. <laughs> this little cover here, clearly metal. Hey, it's also magnetic. Strongly magnetic. Iron is very strongly magnetic, hence we call strong magnetic things ferromagnetic because they're magnetic like iron. Um, nope, that's magnetic too. I'm looking for some obvious metals that are not magnetic, but it looks like I don't have much in that variety here. Aluminum is an example of a metal. Well, what am I talking about? Got my keys. Keys. Magnet. Nada. Now, the key ring is magnetic, and that one key is magnetic, you can see. The others, nothing. 
But of course, these brass keys are clearly metal. So it's not everything that is a metal is magnetic, but some. And clearly not all materials, we've seen that. So that only leaves us the two that you guys answered, which is why I felt pretty good about things. Some metals, clearly some metals was in both of these. And one was no other materials and one was some other materials. It turns out that there are other materials besides metals whoops, that have magnetism. So that was the correct answer. Now, this was strong magnetic behavior. Every material has magnetic behavior, but for some it's extremely weak. There are three kinds of magnetic behavior. So the one that we're used to is the one at the bottom here called ferromagnetism. Ferromagnetism is the strong magnetism. And ferromagnetism can be attractive or repulsive. You have the north and the south like we've talked about. Let's look at the other two, paramagnetism and diamagnetism. All materials are diamagnetic. So if you asked a question without phrasing it carefully, you could say, you know, you know, which materials are magnetic? All of them, because they all have diamagnetism. And diamagnetism is a kind of bizarre behavior that makes a material be repelled by a magnetic field. So all materials are repelled by magnetic fields. See this frog, this <laughs> strawberry, and this <clears throat> Tosunomi, a, a Rixi or Sumotori or whatever you want to call him, a sumo wrestler. I used to follow sumo wrestling very religiously after I went to Japan. Um, and so, um, all of these things have one thing in common. They're levitating. Now, in the upper two pictures, it's just a really strong magnetic field, and you put the um, strawberry or the frog in, and it levitates. It's levitating because of this diamagnetism. You have a strong magnetic field, and water doesn't exhibit paramagnetism or ferromagnetism, so you see the diamagnetism. Water is repelled by magnets. It's very weak. I can take this and turn on the water, get a little stream of water. I'm not going to see that I push the water out, even with this very strong magnet. Right? So it's a very weak effect. But water is diamagnetic, and since the strawberry and the frog are both primarily water, just like you and I are, that diamagnetism is making them levitate, which is super cool. Now, doing it with the strawberry, nobody worries about the strawberry. What's going to happen to the strawberry? Nobody worries, right? The frog, people start to worry. What are we going to do to the frog if we put a strong magnetic field? Well, the outcome is... As far as they can tell, nothing. The, strong, the frog levitates. If you can watch the video on YouTube, the strong, you know, frog rotating around, trying to kick its legs. But it's fine and dandy. It's just like it's in outer space. Now, if you look at the, the Rixi there, Tosunomi. <clears throat> yes, that's how it's pronounced. <laughs> um, the U there is basically saying it's a longer O sound for the O. So that, he's actually on a platform that's being repelled. And so that platform is levitating. And I am sure they have something to stabilize it so it doesn't go shooting off to the side. Because all but the very best of us, would, you know, we're constantly leaning one way or the other and correcting. All but the best of us, as soon as you lean one direction, it shoots out that way and we'd fall. So those are all examples of, well... I know the top two are paramagnetism or are diamagnetism. I think the Tosinomi one is also diamagnetism, but you could also do that by using strong ferromagnets arranged so north is facing north because likes do what? They repel. So you could also do it that way. Okay, so diamagnetism weakly repelled by all magnetic fields. All materials have that. But if they have something that's attractive, 
the attractive one's going to be stronger and you don't see the diamagnetism. So paramagnetism is a weak attraction to all magnetic fields. And so some materials have this paramagnetism and notice it has to do with electrons. You guys probably know electrons have spin. Have you heard that? No? Some of you have. The term came about because people discovered that electrons had a magnetic moment. They behave like little magnets with the north and the south pole. And they said, well, if we had charge going around a circle, it would make a magnetic field just like what we did with the electric motors. And so they said the electrons must be spinning like a top, so the charge is rotating, and that's what gives it its magnetic moment. Well, we now know enough to know that's absolutely not true. The electrons aren't spinning like a top. So when we talk about electron spin, we're not talking about spin. We're just talking about their magnetic moment. We're talking about the orientation of the magnetic field of the electron. So if you have unpaired electrons, that's what gives you this paramagnetism, this weak attractive magnetism. The ferromagnetism is a more complicated situation, but you have, uh-oh, my casting stopped again. You have strong magnetic fields with the ferromagnetism. As soon as it disappears, I will try to reconnect. Because <laughs> I'm assuming since it's dropped, it's going to disappear. There we go. And if it doesn't reappear. I went for a long time this semester without having problems. I don't know why they're starting up now. I'll find somebody to blame, though. It's always best practice, right? Blame somebody. So looking at magnets, we've seen magnets. You have little puck-sized magnets like this. We had bar magnets that I was demonstrating in lab on Monday. Also horseshoe magnets. The shape of the magnet's not important. You can make a magnet about any shape. Remember, what actually makes a magnet a magnet? It's those itty bitty magnetic domains in them. The little regions in your material that act like magnets. And if you can align all of those, it behaves like a magnet. If they're randomly aligned, it doesn't. Now, if I have something like this that has them randomly aligned, if I bring a magnet to it, that magnet will cause some of those domains to rotate a little so that it's attractive, and it'll be attracted. So this would be attracted to either a north or a south because the little domains will orient whichever way is necessary. But this is soft, so I actually magnetized it in lab. It's no longer magnetic because I, it's re-randomized its orientations. And materials that have the most magnetism are iron, cobalt, and nickel. What kind of magnets are these? Um, we actually call them neodymium because neodymium is a, an element that's part of them that gives them their strong magnetism. So these aren't the only strong magnetic materials, but those are the strongest in general. Let's just move forward. We've already learned opposites attract, likes repel. I don't think I need to go any further with that. Magnetic fields. I really didn't talk about the magnetic fields but just like we have electric fields, we have magnetic fields, force fields, fields to help us understand how forces work. And so magnetic field lines are very similar to electric field lines. On the right, we have the electric field lines from an electric dipole. It's a dipole because it has a positive charge and negative charge. On the left, we have the magnetic fields from a magnetic dipole. And those fields look exactly the same, don't they? Well, not exactly. Who can see the difference? Who can see the difference? 
Actually, they're farther apart, but it is in the center where you have the difference. Right, these lines here are farther apart. Whoops, I'm still in the rectangle mode. These lines here are farther apart than they are here. But what's the key difference there? Okay, magnetic field lines always do complete loops. And so it's not actually explicitly shown here, which makes it hard for you to pick it out, but these magnetic field lines are going up in between the two poles. In the electric field, they're going the opposite direction. They don't do complete loops with the electric field. With electric fields, we learned that electric field lines always start on a positive charge, or at infinity, and they always end on a negative charge, or at infinity. Magnetic field lines never start or end. They do loops, coming back on themselves. And so, in the center portion, the magnetic field lines were going opposite direction from what the electric field lines were. Erase that out so I don't have it cluttered. So we have the loops versus non-loops. Otherwise, they're pretty much the same. Magnetic field lines come out of north and go into south. So you can th think of south like you would negative charge. Think of north like you would a positive charge for the field lines. Except for inside the material, inside the material, the magnetic field lines are going from south to north to complete the loops. And because the lines are really close together inside the magnet, what does that tell you about the magnetic field? Because they're closer together, what you noticed? They're stronger, right. So the magnetic fields are very strong inside of the magnet, and then they get weaker outside, where the magnetic field lines spread apart. Now for the Earth's magnetic field. I think that's here. Nope, next slide after this. Oh, no. Is it going to fail again? You, you didn't see anything I drew? No. I drew a lot. Okay, I'm going to go to the wire connection then. There's no point in having hassles. This one's brand new because the last one I had here failed. That was a bad day. All my technology failed. Now I can't go stand in front of people. And yes, I know. You're like, sweet. Now I can see the screen all the time. Okay, now we're back to good. So here we're showing what happens when you put a magnet in a magnetic field. Now remember, magnetic field lines went out of north and into south. So if I put another magnet in something else's magnetic field, there is a force that's going to try to make it rotate. What do we call a force that makes things rotate? A torque. So it creates a torque to make the magnet align with the magnetic field lines so the magnetic field lines will come out of north and go into south. So when we have the compass, remember we had the compass out on Monday, when we have that compass it aligns with Earth's magnetic field so the Earth's south, um, the magnetic fields from the Earth go into the south pole and come out the north pole. And they go into the Earth's south magnetic pole, and hence the north pole, north geographic pole, has to be the south magnetic pole. So because of this torque, it causes alignment, and so you can just take iron filings. Why iron? Because iron is strongly magnetic. Pour them around a magnet, and they will quickly form what visible magnetic field lines. Okay, so now we get to the Earth's magnetic field. Now, I'm glad you told me you weren't seeing something instead of just la 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 la. <laughs> so, 
So here's a picture of what the Earth's magnetic field lines look like. Now, where are we on the Earth? We are somewhere in this picture right around here. Being that we're right there, you can't really tell the angle. But if you look over about that same latitude over here, you see the magnetic field lines at that point are actually pretty steeply angled into the Earth. I had two compasses out here on Monday, but I only showed you one. The other one is a vertical compass. We call it a dip compass. So you can also measure the angle of the magnetic field is going into the Earth. So the magnetic fields for the Earth are doing these kinds of loops going into the North Pole, but since we learned magnetic field lines going to the South Pole of the magnet, another reason to say, aha, the Earth's North Geographic Pole is the South Magnetic Pole. There should be another thing that you notice here that seems wrong. What's that? I will give you the hint. Where is the Earth's North Pole? Geographical. Yeah, geographic. Which is three lines of longitude. Okay. It's here where the axis of rotation is. And so that's the geographic North Pole. But of course, the magnetic North Pole, if we raise this, here's the magnetic North Pole, here's the magnetic South Pole. Our compass doesn't really point perfectly north because the Earth's magnetic South Pole is not exactly at its rotational or geographic North Pole. So your compass isn't perfect. How many people knew compass wasn't perfect? Okay, a few did. Other things. Your compass will vary throughout the day. Did you know that? It's, kind of, it's called the diurnal magnetic shifts because the sun is blowing charged particles at us all the time. And those charged particles interact with the Earth's magnetosphere, the Earth's magnetic fields outside of the Earth. And the charged particles actually distort our magnetic field. And so as the Earth rotates, different parts are being distorted different ways. And so you have a daily variation in how a compass works. Not a big variation, but it's there. Similarly, you have an annual deviation because as we orbit around the sun, the sun is based you know, over different parts of the Earth. Right, so at <clears throat> March 20, I think it was 21 this year, we had the equinox, right? And the equinox is when the sun is passing the equator. And so at that point, the sun was right out the equator. Now, we're 40 degrees north, so the sun was 40 degrees south of us at that point. At its highest point in the sky, it would be 40 degrees south of straight overhead. But then we have the winter and summer solstices. The winter solstice is when the sun is the farthest south it gets, 23 and a half degrees south. Since we're 40 degrees north, that's 63 and a half degrees south, which means that the sun only rises up 23 and a half degrees. 23 and a half? No, that's all right. 90 minus 63 and a half is 26 and a half. The sun only rises 26 and a half degrees above the horizon at its highest point on December 21. Well, then we have the summer solstice approximately uh, June, June? Yeah, it's June 22, something like that. March, April, May, June, yeah. And then the sun is 23 and a half degrees north of the equator, which means that it's only going to be 16 and a half degrees south of straight overhead here. That's what makes the seasons, but because the sun is at those different angles to us, it's also going to affect the magnetic variation we have at that time. So compass reckoning is affected by a lot of things. The biggest part is the Earth's magnetic field. Then you have those two smaller parts. The Earth's magnetic field does not remain constant. If you go today 
and you find exactly the point on the Earth where you have the south pole of the Earth's effective magnet, you put a stake in there, and then you go to bed, you wake up the next morning, and you check your work, you'll find you're wrong. Because the Earth's magnetic poles move as well. They don't stay fixed. So we can say from this, we must not have a fixed bar magnet making our magnetic field. Because the magnetic field, the poles, shift over time. In fact, looking at what they call paleomagnetic records, looking at the ocean floors, they can actually see that the Earth's magnetic fields have flipped. What is the North Pole now, North Magnetic Pole, used to be the South Magnetic Pole. So for instance, if we were to go back a million years, it would be the, the end of the compass that we call the South End that would point toward the North Pole. Because the North Pole would actually be a North Magnetic Pole. On average, the flips have occurred, I think, about every 200,000 years or so. But we are way overdue right now. Confusing, isn't it? Or at least intriguing and interesting, because it's physics, and that's what physics is, intriguing and interesting. The sun is much more regular than the Earth. The sun's magnetic fields flip, I think it's every 13 years, might be 11, I didn't look up the number. But the sun's magnetic fields flip very regularly. And so scientists have been studying those flips. And one of the things they noticed was that for a period of like a month, during the flip, the sun had, I think it was two north poles and no south pole. How can you have two north poles and no south pole? Yeah, they always come in dipoles. You never have a north without a south. So what you have to do is you effectively take two magnets, and these are really strong, take two magnets, and you separate them, and then you put them so that they're repelling each other, and you hold them so they're repelling each other. Now I have two norths on the out and two souths on the in. But it's two separate magnets at this point, right? It's not one magnet. The one magnet occurs when I do it the other way. And I'm trying to do this without breaking them because these things are fragile. Or as we all learned from that great Christmas music, fragile. Must be French. Uh, <laughs> okay, so let's move on. Hans Christian Orsted was getting ready to give a public presentation about the awesomeness of physics. And as he was preparing this, he had a situation where he had a power line, and sitting next to that power line, he had a compass. And when he plugged the power in, he noticed the compass moved. Why would that happen? What would make the compass move? What, what, is the fun, what fundamentally is a compass? Yeah, it's a magnetic thing that can freely rotate. I mean, you know, if you're lost on a desert island and you need to know what direction is north and you can't find the sun, there's a lot of ifs there, you could always get yourself a clam, take out the shell, fill it with water, put a leaf in there, and then find a piece of you know, magnetic material. How do you find magnetic material? Well, there's magnetic rocks. Or take a piece of iron and you know, bang it, hope for the best, because when you bang it, you're going to cause the magnetic domains to realign a little bit. Then you put it on that leaf, and you can watch the leaf rotate, and it'll work as a compass. And you can make your own compass. All you need is a magnet to free to rotate. When I was in graduate school, Sad but true story, I didn't send you all to college. I got to graduate school, it turns out you can't do that. And so I had a, a B minus average my first year of graduate school, as did one of my classmates. Everyone with lower GPAs, they let them leave the program. By letting them leave, they told them they couldn't come back. And so we were the bottom, we were the anchors. And I had this new strategy that I was gonna study. And he had this new strategy 
that he was really going to make his mind work optimally. And so he practiced taking a needle, putting it in water, and trying to make the needle rotate with his mind. And I got up at 7 a.m., went to breakfast, studied until classes, went to classes, studied until 10 p.m., went home, watched Sports Center, went to bed. You might guess what happened. I got all A's the next semester. I didn't see him again after that semester. Um, but the theory is that maybe you could control magnetism with your mind. That was his theory. My theory was maybe I could get better grades if I studied. Let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> studying is important. Maybe not to the level I was studying because I was kind of scared. But, you know, studying appropriate amount, getting enough sleep, watching Sports Center, eating food. Those are pretty much the important things. And going to church every Sabbath. Let me tell you, okay, this is not physics. That was really not physics either. Observing the Sabbath is the biggest blessing God has ever given humanity. When I was in graduate school, I had classmates who were cracking all kinds of crazy ways. You know, I think I told you about the, the girl who had all these sores in her face because she just gouged her face while she was studying, just the, <laughs> the stress of it. I had a classmate, her boyfriend as it turned out, who had all of his eyelashes missing because while he was studying, he was going like this and pulled all, every single eyelash out of his eyes. It's, it's very stressful. Going to church on Sabbath, not studying at all, relaxing, going to potlucks, you know, spending time worshiping God helped to keep me sane. It's really a big blessing God gave us. It would be... Well, it's a sad thing when people think they have to study on the Sabbath because, you know, God gave us the Sabbath so we can recover and not have to study a day and not feel guilty, right? If I didn't study on Sunday, I would have felt guilty. On the Sabbath, I would have felt guilty if I did study. Okay, so moving back to this, Hans Christian Orsted noted that the magnet rotated, the compass magnet rotated when he had a current going through the wire. But what makes a magnet rotate? Okay, the push and pull between the magnet and the external magnetic field. So that must mean that having a current going through the wire created a magnetic field. Now you already saw that in lab on Monday because I told you you have this coil, you're putting current through it, and it makes it so it behaves like a magnet. Having current going through a wire creates a magnetic field. And so, of course, as soon as he discovers this, not some intentional scientific study, just some random, whoa, I did not expect that. Well, then you do do the intentional study. And it's found that if you have current going through a wire, so let's take this no longer necessary wire. If the current is going through this wire going upward, so the current is coming out the top, you take your right hand, we call this a right hand rule because you have to use your right hand, and wrap your fingers around the wire with your thumb pointing the direction of the current, then your fingers will point the direction of the magnetic field doing circles around the wire. Now remember, magnetic fields always have to be loose. And so that's how we know what they're going to be going around in circles, because it's just a wire. For symmetry, circles is the only option. So you use your right hand, and you can determine the direction of the magnetic field. So in this picture, you see the person doing just that, hand-oriented, so it's wrapping around the wire, thumb pointing the direction of the current. And so the fingers are coming out on this side, hence the magnetic field lines are coming out. Fingers are going in on this side, hence going in. So we use this right-hand rule to determine the direction the magnetic field will be created when you have current going through a wire. Since wires create a magnetic field, if I have two wires that are parallel to each other, they both create magnetic fields, and if we use the right-hand rule, in the region between the wires, what direction is the magnetic field due to current one? 
So in this region here, what direction is the magnetic field due to current one? Okay, you did going around a circle. So at this point, what direction is it point? At this location, what direction is the magnetic field one point? Not to the right, not up. It's going to be into the screen. Now we indicate that by putting a circle with an X in it. The X means that it's like looking at an arrow, but you're seeing the fletchings of the arrow. So the arrow is traveling away from you. So that means it's going into the screen. Now let's look over at current two here. What direction is the magnetic field from current two at this point? Okay, using the same rules, it's going to be out of the screen. And we indicate out of the screen, a circle with a dot in it, because then the arrow is coming at you and you see the tip of the arrow coming at you. So we have the magnetic fields that are pointing in opposite directions there. But because those magnetic fields are pointing in opposite directions, what do opposites do for magnets? Opposites attract. attract. And so that's going to pull them together. So the force is the direction that Zach identified. The force is going to pull them together. Wait, is that right? We usually do it a different way in a higher physics class. And so I didn't think about it. Here's how we do it in the physics class. Force equals I1 L. That's the equation we use. And so what I do here is I say, hmm, the magnetic field, for instance, the magnetic field at wire one due to current two is coming out. And then I go I cross B. And it's actually <laughs> for the case, well, for the, uh, yeah. This picture had it shown. I don't have to go through that. It does have shown that it's attractive. I guess I don't have to worry about <laughs> going through it. When the, when the currents are parallel, magnet fields are opposite and it's attractive. I was worried because I was, yeah, I was seeing magnet fields and currents. Parallel currents are attractive. Antiparallel or repulsive. And so that equation I showed, force is equal to, it's a vector, I1 L. That equation, it's using what we call a cross product. It's a vector equation. All that I really care for you to know about that equation is that the force between the wires is going to be proportional to the current, proportional to the magnetic field, and proportional to the length. Well, if I have two wires of infinite length, what does it tell you about the force? If they're really long wires, how big is the force going to be? Proportional to the length. It's going to approach infinity. And so instead of calculating the force total, we have up here the force per length says force over length. Why do we have to do that? Because our equation is technically the equation for an infinite length wire. Um, we calculate a magnetic field for a wire is B is equal to mu ot I over 2 pi R, where R is the distance away from that wire. But that's only true if it's an infinitely long wire. So let's just come back to this. What's important about this? If I have current going through two wires, it's going to create an attractive force if the wires are parallel. What if they were going opposite, anti-parallel? So one current's going up, one current's going down. What would that have changed in my picture? The direction of one of the magnetic fields would have flipped. And then it would be the same direction, and then it would be repulsive. 
So if the currents are going in the opposite direction, you flip one of the magnetic fields, and it's going to be a repulsive force. It's going to push them away from each other instead of pull them toward each other. You still have this equation two times, and they used here a symbol K prime, which is just one times to the minus seven newtons per ampere squared. Um, there is actually a unit that is defined for this, but let's just stick with this. We define the ampere as the current that makes the force between infinite wires two times ten to the minus seven newtons per meter if they have a current of one amp in each wire. That's how we define the ampere. Remember we talked about the definitions of time, of length, and mass? This is actually just our fourth true definition. The Coulomb, the unit of charge, is based on the ampere. The ampere is the one that we calibrate. And the calibration for the ampere is this right here. If I have two parallel wires separated by one meter, and I measure the force between the two wires, the current that makes the force two times in my seven newtons per meter, their force per length, is one amp. Why that definition? Because you can test it anywhere in the world simply and easily. Well, not super easily because two times in my seven newtons per meter, it's a pretty small force. But you can do it. Well, if you have the right equipment. All right, I've only got 10 minutes left. I've got five clicker questions left. Two long parallel wires carry currents 5 amps and 10 amps in opposite directions, as shown. What is the direction of the magnetic field produced by the 5 amp wire at the 10 amp wire? So if I call this I1, then I'm looking for magnetic field 1 over here. All right, we have all our answers, and we have 5, 2, 0, 1, 1. Okay, Michaela, how did you get your answer? Uh, I guess. Yes. Well, how should you have gotten it? <laughs> it is what we've been studying here, the right-hand rule. So who can lead us through how to use the right-hand rule to find the direction of the magnetic field at the 10-amp wire based on the current in the 5-amp wire? I just did, since it's going up, mm -hmm. thumb up. That's right. I don't my to go in that OK, that's exactly it. You take your hand, your right hand, Put your thumb in the direction of the current. So since the current was up, put the thumb up. Wrap your fingers around the wire and at the other wire, what direction your finger's going. So wrap them around this wire on this side. They were going in, hence his answer, in. And that is correct. And so that was the correct answer. Believe it, yep. Another clicker question, two long parallel wires, the same ones, the currents in opposite direction, was the magnitude of the force per unit length exerted on one wire due to the other? Now for this, do you remember that it's force per length is equal to 2K prime times... where k prime was 2 times 10 to the minus 7 
and I think the units were uh, newtons per ampere squared. I might have an extra two in there. Like I said, we don't usually use the constant that way. It might be that this was one. I think it is. You will be able to, well. Uh, I have to go back to the previous slide to remember what the K prime was. This won't affect you. I'm going to go back and just make sure what it is. Look at it here. So the K prime is, yeah, 1 times 10 to the minus 7. Okay, we only have five answers. Okay, everybody's answered. We have quite a mix. So let's just do the math now. We're going to have the force per length is equal to 2 times 1 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons per ampere squared times 5 amps. And I ran out of space. It's okay. over my separation is 5 centimeters, so that's 0 0.05 meters. And now I just have to do my math. Notice 5 divided by 5 is 1. Two times 10 is 20, so I'm going to do that. 20 amps times 1 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons per amp squared times 1 amp over 0 0.01 meters divided by 100 or excuse me divided by 1 over 100 is the same as multiply by 100 so I got to multiply the top by 100 20 times 10 to the minus 7 is 2 times 10 to the minus 6 times 100 so 2 times 10 to the minus 6 minus 5 minus 4 Hopefully that's the same answer as, good, it's the same answer as one of them. So just plug in numbers into the equation and we got our answer. Yet another question. Two long parallel wires carry currents of 5 amps and 10 amps in opposite directions. Same problem as before. What are the directions of the forces on each wire? Okay, we've all answered. Well, once again, the four are correct. I don't know if it's the same four, but four people have been correct, I think, each time. If they were parallel, that was the first case we did. Because they were parallel, it made the magnetic fields opposite, and they attracted. If they're anti-parallel, one up and one down, then the magnetic fields are the same direction and it's repulsive. 
what do you thought, what do you suppose it would be if one wire was going vertical and one wire was going horizontal? I haven't told you the answer. This is what do you think? It turns out there are some, some interesting things about how magnets work. And if the magnet fields are perpendicular to each other, there's no force. Because of this, if you do electrical wiring in your house and you have something like a power line and an Ethernet cable, if you have the power line and the Ethernet cable parallel, the magnetic fields from the power line will cause motion of electrons in the Ethernet cable. But if you put them perpendicular, it won't. So you want to keep the cables far away and when they have to cross, cross perpendicularly so you don't have interference by the power line on your internet cable. Okay, we're out of time so I'm going to stop here.